Okay, again, thank you all so much for being here. My name is Janae, I'm with Prevent Connect, and thank you for being with us for Health Equity in Practice, Foundations for Sexual Violence Prevention, Part 4, How to Connect and Educate Around Social Justice Issues. A little note from us, Prevent Connect is a national project for, of value, Valor US, and NSVRC is a national project of Respect Together. Both projects are sponsored by the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views and information provided in this web conference do not necessarily represent the official views of the US government, CDC, Valor, or Respect Together. This is the fourth of a five-part series on health equity in practice, and the whole goal of this series is to rethink onboarding and the skills that we're really uplifting as people come into this movement. So earlier this year in July, we talked about how social justice issues connect to our work to prevent sexual violence, and we talked about why anti-racism is an integral part of sexual violence prevention. Last week, we were joined by some amazing presenters across the country to talk about how to transform field language and strategies into on the ground change. Today, we're really talking about taking that knowledge and then putting it out, connecting with our communities and educating around social justice issues. And next week, all in the culmination, we're having a conversation about how to build cross movement partnerships to advance health equity. And you can register for that session now. It's one week from today. Registration is free at preventconnect.org. We're really excited to be joined by the Wyoming Coalition to talk about their youth summit with the Wind River Reservation. So really highly recommend that one. If you haven't watched the first three web conferences, you still can. The recordings are available at preventconnect.org. And while each of these web conferences can stand on their own, they're really meant to build off of each other. So watching those recordings of previous ones will make the material and the content, and the conversations that we're having now more meaningful because we don't have time to go back and kind of talk about a lot of that foundational stuff. Today, as we're talking about communication, messaging, and connection, we're going to clearly define messaging, storytelling, and audience engagement as it pertains to sexual violence prevention. We're also going to identify some of the strengths, challenges, and opportunities to shift narratives and collaborate with community partners in our prevention efforts. And we're also going to focus on developing a toolbox of skills to create prevention stories that resonate with our stakeholders, partners, and and sometimes our adversaries. This is a flowchart that we showed at the first couple of sessions of our web conference series, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. You can go back and watch those recordings if you want some of that information, but this is kind of the base knowledge that a lot of us get over time working in prevention, right? We know that sexual violence does not exist in a vacuum, and we are tasked with understanding why sexual violence happens, and not just sexual violence, all social justice issues, right? So those are the things that the bottom, what we see. These are the things that we're confronted with every day that people recognize. But as preventionists, we have to look up and think about what are the causes of those things. So in the what we live, that's our social determinants of health. We talked a lot about that in the second session. These are our environments, the ways that we live our lives that impact and create social justice issues. At the root of all of that, though, is oppression and white supremacy above that. And so in order to prevent violence, systemic violence, including sexual violence, we have to be working across all social justice issues. We have to be working in anti-oppression. Elsa, you can go to preventconnect.org and go to our past web conferences, and that's where you can watch all of those recordings for free. So we have this big chart, right? This was, I made this at the beginning of the session because I had a hard time understanding how things relate to each other. If I have a hard time understanding that, how am I going to get that message out to other people, right? So this is kind of what we have going on inside of the field. But a lot of us don't get into this field because we're in public health. Some people do. A lot of us come from different walks of life too. And something that's really powerful about prevention and preventionists is how creative preventionists are. A lot of people who come into prevention, I have heard, and we were just talking about this before the call, didn't even know that prevention was a job, right? We're 
communicators, we're grassroots organizers, sometimes we're academic, sometimes we're just really passionate and got involved in a community event. And that might lead us to a local organization where we get our first job as an advocate or in prevention. But the longer that we're here, the further we get away from that really creative conversational space and the more integrated we get into the health equity terminology the social determinants of health, grant language. We start learning a language that we speak to each other. And sometimes those skills of speaking to other people in ways that resonate get lost along the way. So this web conference is really about reconnecting back with that creativity. We did a word cloud in our last session around terminology about what prevention means to people working in the field. And this is what we got. So upstream, social determinants, health equity, social ecological model, community level work, things that mean a lot to us in this room, but this isn't going to mean anything to my neighbor or the person at my school board meeting or someone that I'm talking to at a farmer's market. I could spend 10 minutes trying to explain the social ecological model, and that's not really going to inspire anyone. The social ecological model in and of itself doesn't inspire me what it means does. And so this web conference is really about getting back and understanding our message as a whole. So on one end, while we're dealing with not really knowing what our stories are, what our message is, how we resonate with other people, we're also seeing a big influx of the other side who is doing a really great job at messaging. So we recently had a national town hall. Also, a couple of our panelists have done a lot of work around fighting backlash. It was also a focus at the National Sexual Assault Conference. We're seeing a really organized effort from adversaries to get preventionists out of schools. They're reclaiming words like the like grooming rhetoric. They're trying to get rid of LGBTQ lessons. They're talking about how social emotional learning is a bad thing for kids. You know, a lot of times we're we're in this space where all of a sudden the work that we're doing is kind of being turned against us and we don't always have the tools to respond and resonate and inspire people in ways that we're seeing that happen on the other side. At the end of the day, health equity is our work. We all have a vision for a world free of violence. Sometimes we just forget what it's like to talk about that vision and to bring other people into this. So we really want to center people around creativity, around letting go of some of that terminology and thinking about how we connect to each other. So before we jump into our panel, I want to start off with a chat question just to kind of get us started. Would love to hear from you. What makes a good story? Think about a story that you really connect with. What's in it? What makes it something that you remember? Whether it's a happy story or a sad story, maybe it could be something about the work. Maybe it's a book you read recently or a TV show. What makes a good story? Emotional connection, a beginning, middle, and end, an ability to connect. It pulls you in. Oh, yeah, these are amazing. Absolutely. It's real. Overcoming adversity, relatability, movement and development when people express their feelings. I think I saw connection to people who are telling that story. Hope, authenticity, people, true stories, evokes emotion. Absolutely. These are incredible. Thank you so much. And I don't see any of this in that word cloud that I showed a minute ago. So oftentimes when we talk about sexual violence prevention, what we're doing is talking about people, but you oftentimes can't understand it by the words that are coming out of our mouths. And it's a skill that not only needs to be nurtured from the beginning, but it's something that we need to come back to as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Feel free to keep putting those in the chat, but I'm going to transition us over to our incredible panel. I am so excited to be joined by our panelists. Some are coming from the sexual violence prevention movement. Some are coming from education justice. Some are storytelling experts. I'm really excited to pass it over to them. So I will introduce 
Meghna Bott coming to us from Gulabi Stories, Marta Johnson from the Mis Michigan Education Justice Coalition, Monica, Gar Monica Garcia Vega from the Florida Council Against Sexual Violence, Ricky Conry from Harm Harmony Labs, and Sarah Ferrado from the Ohio Alliance to End Sexual Violence. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you. Thank you for being here. I am going to stop sharing and spotlight our presenters so that everyone can see them a little bit better. One moment. Okay, hi, how are you all? Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. Hi, Jen. it's great to be here. Thank you, it is great to have you. Well, let's just jump right in because I have a lot of questions for you. And as a reminder for everyone else, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and we'll uplift them or add them at the end if we have time. But we're talking about storytelling. Let's just kind of set the stage. Why is storytelling so important to advancing social justice? I can add, first of all, thank you, Praven Connect, uh, for having me in the space and to the wonderful panelists. Um, and Meghna Bhatt, my pronouns are she, her, hers. So in terms of storytelling, when I think of storytelling and what I have learned is also, you know, when I talk about storytelling, it's true personal stories being shared in a first person perspective from their lived experiences, right? And um, as we all know, uh, storytelling has been used for ages by uh, black and brown feminists, advocates, organizers for liberation and healing. So it is not new. Um, we also see Native American and indigenous communities using storytelling as a traditional practice to connect the elders with the younger generations. So technically we are, you know, without even mentioning the label social justice, there is being work being done using storytelling in the past. So I just wanted to acknowledge that first. Um, Secondly, when I think about storytelling, it's also from a social justice lens. I think it's necessary is about necessary about like creating spaces for stories, but also whose stories are missing, right? Um, and I see storytelling as a beautiful way to humanize issues, to humanize people, and our lived experiences and struggles, um, whether it is through art, community organizing, restorative circles. Um, and I just wanted to definitely mention is as much as we, it's important to capture like intergenerational trauma and um, abuse through storytelling, I see social justice, you know, within this field, it's also important to like capture intergenerational joy and wisdom, right, from that place. Um, so I, I, just to wrap up, I feel like storytelling can bring those nuances and layers of lived experiences, um, story, you know, social problems, um, also highlight moments of you know, victory and success stories, right? Um, so it helps building empathy, creating community cohesion, working towards prevention. Um, and again, we have seen we all, you know, most of us are doing this work is also about using stories for like policy making, lobbying for our communities, you know, for their rights and well being. So um, yeah, I'll take a pause here. Thank you so much. That's, yeah, that's such a wonderful way to start us off. And Sarah, I know you also had some thoughts on this one. Yeah, thank you so much, Magna. I think that you've grounded the space in a really important way um, to kind of build on some of um, the features that Magna spoke about. We also see this in a lot of revolutionary um, movements throughout history. So one of the biggest ways that we have seen storytelling work to um, advance social change and really revolution toward liberation has been in DIY spaces, do-it-yourself spaces, such as zines um, and newspapers and, um, and different printed work that was passed from household to household. So um, an organizer um, and theorist, Clara Zetkin, talks at length in an article about this and says that 
the revolutionary woman isn't the one who's able to come to the community meetings, but rather the, the woman who is in her home teaching her family. And how do we reach that person in the home when she's not able to make it to the community space? And so one of the strategies that was used was really to create essentially like a free newspaper or zine, right? Um, to tell these stories and to start building political education to um, build solidarity, class solidarity, because knowing that before we started to invisibilize domestic labor um, as labor, that we knew that that labor was happening of education in the household. So really talking around the dinner table about what was going on. Um, additionally, we know that we don't move people with data. And so we talk about that a lot, but in our professionalized field, we often fall back on data to tell stories. But really the data is driven by story, right? Like by people's experiences, this is how we collect data. So how do we get back to that space of telling the story that drives those numbers? Um, we move better together in community when we find commonality across experiences, not in numbers. Um, so percentages aren't going to be the thing that says, you know what, I'm, I'm ready to get involved. Um, we're seeing it today, even with the mass unionization movement, right? Like we're seeing people striking across work sectors all over the country. The biggest reason for that is because people are finally sharing stories about their workplace disparities, about the working environments and lack of material conditions that people need in order to survive. Um, and so we are seeing commonalities, but also within that, it's about uplifting that there are going to be unique experiences that bring people to that. So the storytelling isn't just about telling the one story to Magna's point about what stories are missing and how do we make sure that those stories are incorporated and that they are given the same power that we um, in this professionalized field give to our data research and evaluation. Thank you, Sarah. And Marta, yeah, I know you you have some thoughts to add as well. Yeah, so Marta, she, her pronouns, I work with the Michigan Education Justice Coalition. So coming at this really from the perspective of supporting parent, caregiver, and student organizers across our state um, that are in um, working to influence school districts and um and, and school boards and really facing a lot of attacks on um, in, in different ways. But what I'll say is one of the very first things we do with new volunteer leaders is to start training them on sharing their story. It's really useful for public comment at school board meetings. It's really useful for when you're talking with legislators. It's really useful just in one-on-one -on -one conversations or in community events in so many ways figuring out how to share experiences and share what brings you to the work of education justice um, is really powerful. It helps develop people as leaders. It helps them feel empowered. It invites more people to connect with issues that either directly experience it or don't so that they can feel a connection there. Um, and it helps grow and build community. And then as everyone was saying, I completely agree. It is so effective in moving policy. Um, and data, yes, but stories are critical. They're key. It helps humanize. Um, and that is so important for moving the needle on a lot of these issues that intersect. Thank you so much, all of you, for setting the stage. And I I completely, I'm completely with you. You know, I think we could have a whole other panel about why it is so challenging to harness stories in our work. Um, and that's not our focus today, right? You know, we really want to focus on how we're moving through. I want, I just want to validate if people are here in the audience and thinking like, oh my gosh, I never do that. Like when I go out to my community and I'm boothing, I'm giving percentages and I'm talking about how many people in our shelters and this is exact, I'm doing the opposite. And I just want to validate that like that is there's also a place for that and that's also okay this is not a skill that we teach people coming into this which is why we want to have a full conversation about it it does take a shift so i'd love to hear from you all where have you found success in storytelling and bringing people into our work as allies and community champions monica would you like to get us started 
Hey, so uh, I'm Monica, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm at the Florida Council Against Sexual Violence, which is Florida's sexual assault coalition. Um, and I'm sure you've heard about Florida in the news. Um, we're kind of in the same boat as many other states where we've seen a lot of pushback against prevention initiatives and efforts, um, but we have seen successes. Um, so I think the number one thing when uh, trying to do prevention in your community is to also be an active member of your community outside of the professional sense um, so that you're not just interacting with members of your community or organizations in community when you need something from them or when you need to meet a deliverable, um, but you already have those networks in place and those relationships in place because a lot of prevention really is just relationship and community building. Um, so, um, that's something that we've done with uh, here locally are like queer feminist bookstores. Uh, we frequent them just like in our personal lives. Uh, we make relationships with the people who own the bookstores. And then um, when you form those relationships, you end up talking about what you do for work. And that leads into an opportunity to connect. Um, and so like we've been able to join in some of their drag story hours for like sexual assault awareness month. Um, and teach kids about like consent and bodily autonomy uh, through children's books. And that's something that wouldn't have happened uh, without us just frequenting those community spaces as members of the community and not necessarily as like having our advocate or preventionist hat on. Um, so just really taking the time to engage in your community like that and like walking the walk and talking the talk. Um, and then also sometimes you need to be willing to be a little bit of a troublemaker and be willing to rock the boat. Um, I think especially in the way that our movement has been so professionalized, um, we're so used to like reading our contracts and seeing our deliverables and like seeing that as like the limitations of our work um, and not really having those difficult conversations with our funders or with our allies or community partners on, um, hey, I know this is something that we need to do. So how do we get that done? What are your boundaries on this issue? And then establishing your own boundaries, your own personal boundaries and your own agency's boundaries. Um, because I think sometimes we're just, we, I mean, for lack of a better term, we're complicit and um, we get scared and it is scary sometimes, um, but a lot of us are in these positions of power um, and we don't really utilize or leverage that power. So sometimes being willing to make that trouble um, is necessary and um, I think it speaks to how we've strayed from the origins of our movement to to where um, speaking as someone from that works in the coalition space um, we've kind of framed coalitions and rape crisis centers as like neutral spaces um, when it comes to like our activism and our politics um, but the origins of the anti-violence movement was inherently political and uh, rooted in our activism, um, but that's something that we've kind of divorced ourselves from. So um, kind of moving ourselves back towards those spaces. Um, and that is gonna be, um, it is gonna ruffle some feathers, um, but that's what, what the work is. Um, and then I think some other, like, I guess, concrete, concrete examples that we've seen um, that work here in Florida, um, besides like our queer feminist bookstores, um, just meeting um, young people where they are in the communities. Sometimes collaborating with schools is hit or miss. It just depends on um, what the relationships are like and, and local politics are like. So um, if you can't get into the schools, um, just going to their local march, martial arts centers or their gymnastics classes um, or your local libraries are such a good resource um, and super accessible to the community, uh, but they're not utilized as much. Um, uh, oh, and then another strategy too um, that has worked for us is um, sometimes you need to do the work and be okay with it not being as visible or um, without getting all the credit for it. Um, sometimes uh, we do the work and we need to get out resources, but we can't put our name on it because um, the varying interests of our allies and funders and all of that. So sometimes you just need to be willing to do this work um, without getting all of the credit and all the glory um, and just know that it's getting to the people that it needs to, um, whether it is through like some underground routes or uh, whatnot, but sometimes it's just not gonna be as visible as it should be. Yeah, those are my thoughts. Thank you. I agree. We all need to 
raise a little trouble. And I think what you shared too, just makes me think about the personhood first, which oftentimes gets so lost when our movement is professionalized and we're all professionalized. Marta, I would love to hear what you have to add. Oh yeah. So yeah, as I said before, I come from an education justice organizing perspective. So we work a lot with violence prevention prevention as allies, um, but just a slightly different approach. And hopefully that's a helpful pr fresh perspective or something or fresh-ish. Um, I resonate so much with a lot of what Monica has said in terms of meeting people where they're at and really going out of your way um, to like not be the always the convener of everything. And so to look for opportunities to show up for other people in other spaces and recognize how they're already showing up. So um, for this translate for us sometimes in Facebook groups um, or in other um, community, um, grassroots community organizations, et cetera. Like, so I think showing up for them without a transactional, you know, next step, I think is a really important way to start building that relationship in an authentic way and finding where, where there is that natural and recognizing that natural um, connection to then be able to, to work together towards co-creation on, um, on addressing problems together and, and building a larger um, community of folks to, to work with. Um, and yeah, I think that that to me is really one of the most critical things is to not assume it doesn't exist or that you have to create it, but to recognize where it is and show up where it is. Thank you so much. And that moves us really well into this next question because, you know, I think something that I've heard several times already is the need to slow down and connect with someone, of taking the time to show up for someone first, to build those relationships. So much of what we're taught is, you know, you get your elevator speech ready and you have to sell someone on the work that you're doing and you don't have the time to build that relationship. But I mean, if we're talking about stories, it has to start there. You know, this whole web conference series has been focused on building up preventionist toolboxes to engage communities in the health and well-being of all people. And I think one of the challenges that I see people struggle with is this, like, I need to educate on what prevention is, not just advocacy, while countering misconceptions about sexual violence, while connecting to other social justice movements, while talking about why we need to be in the schools, while getting people to join me in two minutes or less, because otherwise this person is going to turn off. And then, like, you get the glaze and you're just like, da 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 da, -da and then it's blank stares. Um, may, I'm speaking for myself, I guess, that like my first couple of years, I think especially as a someone doing the work on the ground, I was like, no one cares, but I wasn't finding the through line of what they care about. What is the challenge or what are some challenges with having those conversations like the one that I just mentioned? And Megna, if you'd love to, if you'd like to get us started, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm enjoying this discussion. It's such a great learning experience. Um, I think one of the things I want to mention that before we start thinking about that, you know, just that one conversation about the elevator pitch, I want to like, I, I it's helpful for me um, always to like have some grounding, right? And I think, you know, compared to like what uh, to add what's already been shared here, um, many times as we are aware that folks and communities are doing prevention work without having the titles, without having the jobs or the language or necessarily in this field, right? And I want to name it because sometimes that becomes very intimidating when we come into this field, not knowing the terminology, not knowing or not having enough time for training, right? So there's a sense of isolation, intimidation of how prevention should look like due to grants and technicalities. And there's no one right way of doing prevention, but I'm also mindful that it has its nuances. So I don't want to say, you know, it, it is the only way. So for example, what I have been learning is, um, again, creating innovative conversations and spaces and communities to talk about prevention, right? Not only centered in anti-sexual violence work. So when I, for example, when I went to the recent uh, YMCA to check out what classes they had, they actually had some healthy relationship programs or uh, by one of the agencies there. And I, I, I had this conversation about how it went and how many youth came up, you know, showed up and, it was just one of those things where you have to find a like a common topic, even if it is not about prevention, right? How do you connect to that person through a shared experience? 
Um, and to give, the, you know, I think just to give our audience some context uh, about my background, I created Gulabi Stories, which is a South Asian healing initiative from an individual artist grant, right? I received from Sacramento Arts and Culture. But again, we are not a prevention program. It's through arts, uh, but we, there is prevention work being done. Um, so like, how do you, I, I want to mention like, you know, we cannot kind of, um, we have to be organic about it. We are not able to like narrow down to that one perfect conversation or elevate a pitch, right? To amplify prevention work being done or how storytelling has been brought into it. Um, Gulabi Stories are, is doing prevention work through art, storytelling and community building, right? Um, and I just want to, you know, I want people to feel, I hope people can feel seen in our audience that, um, again, prevention is not necessarily in an official capacity, but then um, our conversations may also look different depending on our capacity with whom we are talking, depending on our audience. Um, and, our, you know, again, in, in terms of the setting, right, like depending on where we, I think, Sarah, you had mentioned about the farmer's market, you know, I think you'd mentioned that. And, it all depends on how we connect on those other shared experiences and still bring prevention into that conversation. Um, so I'll, I'll take a pause. Thank you so much. Yeah, Monica, what do you have to add? Uh, I wanna emphasize everything Magna just said, uh, because it is so important, uh, especially like I was saying, how we really professionalize the movement and we've kind of pushed people out that, founded the movement. Um, and then and those are the people that are in those capacities that aren't called prevention specialists or don't work with a coalition or a rape crisis center. So emphasizing everything Magna said. Um, and then um, the, the, the problem with having conversations that are super scripted, scripts are great, uh, bullet point, like talking points are great. Um, they really help me, I'm neurodivergent. So it really helps me to like kind of have, um, like a rough outline of what you're trying to get across, but um, every conversation should be as authentic and organic as possible. And you you have to understand that people are way smarter than you think they are. And they know when you're just giving them a, uh, like a script or a spiel that you've given to every single person. Um, and so naturally they're not gonna be interested in what you have to say if what you have to say isn't specifically relevant to them and their everyday lives. Um, so um, when approaching people, I think it's really important to just establish you know, your shared goals and shared values. And sometimes that can be as basic as, you know, we both wanna create a safe community. This is how we can do it. Or here's like one avenue of doing that. Um, and not necessarily throwing in all of the, you know, jargon and a fancy language that comes with some of the sides of this, um, this work. So just establishing those uh, shared values and shared goals, um, but then also uh, really being mindful of your own boundaries and then your own agency's boundaries and the boundaries of the movement and knowing what you're willing to compromise on and what is a hard no. Um, so something that we've done a lot here in Florida is adapting our language, um, depending on your audience. Um, and so stuff like social emotional learning has, a, has been a lot in the media and has a lot of misconceptions and uh, misinterpretations of that concept. So um, you maybe not using those words that have been in the media a lot that um, can sometimes seem inflammatory. And we've been replacing it with resiliency building, which is now written into the educational standards. And we have all of that information and data to back it up. So um, we've been willing to compromise on adapting our language to that, uh, but we're not willing to compromise on um, teaching abstinence only sex education. So stuff like that, the, just being really honest with yourself and then internally with your agency on uh, what you're willing to compromise on and what your actual values are. Um, and making sure that uh, you're approaching this relationship building, community building from an authentic place. And not just because, uh, like I said, you have like a deliverable to finish or a deadline coming up, uh, but because you really want to create a safer community for you and for the people that are coming behind you. Thank you. 
so much. And congratulations to the work that you're doing in Florida. That's really amazing. And I know that you and Sarah have a lot of those conversations around getting really real with our language. And I'm excited to get to that later. I would love, I think, you know, you talked a lot about kind of a shared vision and authenticity, and I'd love to pass it to Marta and Ricky too, to kind of jump in here because you both are not in the sexual violence prevention movement, but you are experts in this storytelling and connecting with people. So maybe let's go to Marta and then Ricky, I'd love to hear your thoughts too. Sorry, I just had to unmute really quickly. Um, yeah, for when I think about this issue, first I have an organizer brain always. So I think, you know, having skills in deep canvassing um, can be really helpful. Heal Together has a, some really great virtual deep canvassing trainings that I think are really valuable for anybody working in community building um, to address social problems um, spaces, even if you're not like a quote unquote organizer. Um, and the Empower app also has some interesting trainings and some tools that folks can use in um, for communicating and organizing um, in different ways. So I just wanted to lift those up. But I think like, you know, the the main thing that I think about when I think about what what I want to share with other people is to really keep it simple and have a positive vision that I'm inviting people into, um, but also be asking a lot of questions. So like, you aren't talking quite as much as you're asking them to talk because I think that's where connections happen more authentically is when people feel like you care about them as a person and that you're actually listening and responding to what they're saying. Um, so those are those are some things about how I approach this issue of like, how do you fit all of these complex things in when it comes to like education justice for me personally, that's um, and di for different audiences, like that's how I generally approach it and would re recommend resources for people to check out as well. But I'll pass it to Ricky because I know much more of a, an, an expert in, in storytelling here. I am not because I'm not a storyteller. I'm a statistician. It's okay, Sarah, we can still be friends, even though you noped my data. Uh, I work for Harmony Labs. We are a media research lab. So when I think about story, I'm thinking really big. I like personal narration. That's really great. Uh, but I'm also thinking about solar punk and the power it has to narrate a climate healthy future, like all the work that can be done by story. The question you're asking, um, Janae, is really important. It's about getting stuck in the checklist. And when we see partners get stuck in the checklist, it's because they've been trained to message. Messaging is really important. We do sometimes need people to receive instructions to behave or believe in a particular way, but the power of story is more emotional. And so if you only have that 60 seconds with an audience member, um, taking an audience first approach and agreeing ahead with your organization, like Monica saying, like, how can we make sure that we are all in general in the right ballpark without scripting people and robbing them of their power, stuffing their mouths with words they wouldn't say. What you can do is you can agree what that audience is, like who is it that you're after? And an audience is the group of people who go the same place to like consume the same stories. What do they want from their stories? And how are we gonna connect to that story? How are we all gonna feel at the end of the storytelling e episode with that person? If you can name something that's about the story pattern or the narrative that you wanna to achieve together, that is liberatory in the 60 seconds and you don't have to check the, hit the checklist. So starting with audience, and really truly understanding who you're talking to and where they're coming from and why is easier than trying to hit message. Yeah, wow, thank you. I, yeah, and I think, you know, you made me think a lot about kind of where we get stuck in our definitions. And I know that's something that we had talked about too. I think it's very natural for preventionists too, especially when we're kind of more science adjacent and public health adjacent to be like, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? You know, and I even think about that with messaging and storytelling. We can conflate the terms a lot. And I think we can also get bogged down and being like, what is what? And how do I do each one of those things? You know, without spending too much time going in there, I think it might be helpful for us to talk about that. How would you define the difference between education, messaging, and storytelling? This is a little different for everyone. It's really important not to spend all your time on it. We in this room are an audience because we came to the same 
place to look at the same stuff. And I happen to study audience for a living. So I guarantee that this whole room, including the whole audience is terminology buffs and could spend all day here. But here's how to think about this. A story is something where something happens to someone. Generally speaking, in the work that we do, we should always have it have a beginning that acknowledges past harms, a middle, where we are, and this is the part we often forget, an end. Um, it should narrate a future. In fact, in testing across every issue from nukes to climate to gender, narrating the future is more important than any other part of the story and getting audiences on board for that future. Um, messaging, in general, when we think about it, is an instruction to behave or believe some specific thing. So it's like the elections in two weeks, you got to vote is a message. You can frame that in various ways, but typically it's not a story. Stories knit together in our minds to make narratives. And those are the engines of change. I love that. Thank you. And Marta, I think we had talked about, you had some, some to share about differences for different audiences too. Yeah, no, I so resonate with what Ruby said. That was a genius way to put it. I think when I think about this question, I think about the different jobs for different like targets or audiences. I'm such an, yeah, definitely organizer brain here. Um, so I see education happening after impacted people or allies feel pulled into organizing for solutions. Um, I think it's useful for building up confidence and propelling organizing forward. Messaging I see is for broader audience framing, for helping direct, you know, broader folks to, to action um, and to align with what you're wanting to, to happen or do. Um, and it helps them digest and connect with your issues and solutions to do something. Storytelling is the heart of bringing people in as organizers and champions. And it's the most influential thing decision with decision makers as well. I think in partnership with data, of course, um, but we hear over and over from um, legislators and other decision makers that stories really are critical and we need more of them. <laughs> Thank you. I, I so deeply appreciate that. And what distinct roles do each of those have in advancing our work and communities? I'd love to start it with Sarah. Yeah, I think so. When I think about the ways that we frame these different strategies, I think that sometimes it can fall into how we silo intervention and prevention. And so I would really um, encourage us to think about them being used concurrently. So using them together to weave um, the advancement of social change. Because so we think about um, as somebody who comes into this work from a pretty different approach. So my background's in art history with a focus in gender studies and um, sexual health education. And one of the turning points that I started to recognize, especially because story is so important to me as an avid reader who also sees the benefits of like reading and sharing story um, to connect, not just for social change, but that's how we connect with people in general, right? And so some of the most important lessons that I feel like I've learned to expand how I approach prevention and the ways, so with the Ohio Alliance to End Sexual Violence, our role um, and coalitions look different in every state. So our um, coalition is much more macro and we don't do a lot of on the ground community work. Um, our community, our audience is focused in on our rape crisis centers and our members based agencies and um, member individual members. Um, so we provide technical assistance and training and that is the kind of like encapsulation of the work, um, as well as that systems advocacy piece. I come to the work in a different way because art history has informed so much of how I move in the world because art tells the story of change. Um, art tells the story of the moment, but it also prepares us for what's to come and also what happened before. So much to Ricky's point about this beginning, middle and end of storytelling, we see that through art in an ongoing way. Um, so I've learned from a lot of different writers over the years, um, one of which Rachel Angel Lee, who is um, an anarchist organizer, um, a queer femme, 
um, who also is in academia. So holds like a lot of these just like kind of push and pull moments um, and is also a memoirist. And she talks deeply about auto theory and auto theory is really about how do we take our stories and weave in theory in a way that brings people in, um, especially to tell our stories from an intersectional lens. And so what it does is instead of us listing off all of the reasons why we're here to do what we do and naming all of our privileges and oppressions, which can actually disconnect a lot of people from the work, we're educating messaging and storytelling all at once by weaving those together. The other thing I think about is how we can start to expand our theories. We talk so much about health equity and public health frameworks, but how are we taking other theories and applying it into our work instead of getting stuck in this kind of loop of the same theories over and over again? Because when we say there's no one right way, then that seems counter, kind of counterproductive or contradictory if we are only using a very small set of frameworks to do the work and to, to storytell. So I even think about like, we talk about intersectionality at length, right? And then it's so critical to the work we do um, in anti-oppressive frameworks that founds all of the work we do in prevention. We also know that that theory was created by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw in order for that to um, address a very specific need in the legal system. And we've now taken it and applied it all across the board, but we aren't even listening to Dr. Crenshaw when she says, who has been in conversation with Jasper Puer, another theorist, that assemblage theory is actually something that we can use even more deeply to apply to our work. Because assemblage theory says that we're taking we're taking these lists that we make of our privileges and oppressions and knowing that the human experience isn't just about a list. It's actually about how we move through the world and that our human experiences change and evolve and flux throughout that time. And so how do we make sure that we're looking at people as whole, right? The assemblage theory says, so I'll take, I'll use my, you know, my identities as uh, an example that in the dominant culture, in cis white heteropatriarchy, my trans and queerness is looked at as oppression, right? However, when I move into a queer space, I am incredibly cis passing. And so in the trans community, I have an incredible amount of privilege. But those things are always in flux because I also have a, the privilege of cis passing in dominant culture as well. And so it's not about us just listing off these things and saying that's education and that's storytelling, but really how do we bring all of these things together and continue to expand on what we say is what we want to do to found our work in anti-oppressive frameworks um, in education, messaging and storytelling. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. Megna, I, do you have anything that you'd like to add here? Um, yeah, just very quickly. I think Sarah's beautifully captured like everybody else. Um, it was helpful to have that, you know, um, def not definition, like a framing from Ricky and Marta. And um, I think I just want to like quickly add in terms of to build what was already discussed is like I've seen education messaging and storytelling also being perceived and implemented within the context of the social ecological model right with stories being on an individual or relationship level um, how these stories convey the messages to a larger societal you know larger society or community and education is kind of perceived as you know, collective institutional systemic level. Um, that does not mean that, again, that's the only because it's again, more complex and nuanced than we know, um, but to echo like what many of us are sharing, I don't want us, you know, I want us to be, I, I want us to make sure that we don't get lost in the technicalities or the process, right? So uh, as Sarah mentioned, some of, sometimes these are all intertwined together. Uh, woven together, it occurs simultaneously at the same time. So education, messaging and stories, can be happening at the same time and having the same impact as when we are looking at it, you know, differently. Um, so I, I mean, I'm, I just wanted to like elevate that and just add to that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And that makes me think too, what we were talking about 
toward the beginning of this too, or how we can get bogged down with our terminology, especially in being aligned with public health field. You know, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. It, we spent a lot of time on that in our previous web conference about the gatekeeping of our language and how it holds us back and really getting right inner organizationally and within ourselves with that terminology, where it serves us, where it doesn't. And so I, if you haven't checked out that session, I highly recommend it. Since we're focusing on communicating outside of this field, which seems like the next step in that, I would love to hear from you all, especially those who have made that shift. When did you start to think, okay, I need to start communicating outside of the field, not just to my colleagues, but to my neighbors. And what has that journey been like? And I say it journey because it's not something that you just like do overnight. I feel like I'm still catching myself on try on saying the wrong things. And I welcome anyone to jump in on this one. So if I can ask a clarifying question, when you're talking about outside of the field, are you talking about like outside of your constituency or like the the people that are directly impacted on, on violence in this situation? Or could you say more about that? Yeah, I'm talking about maybe the difference between this space where we're talking about social justice to people who are working in social justice to maybe those like parent and caregiver spaces. Like what was that adjustment like for you? How would you how do you speak differently to those two? And like how did you unlearn the professional things that we have in these spaces? Yeah, for I'll just jump in if it gives people a little space to also think that are maybe more directly in the field. I think, you know, one of the interesting things about working directly with parent and caregiver organizers that are impacted, we work with school district, people in school districts all over um, our, our state in Michigan. So it includes rural districts that have been taken over by extremists and are pulling books and banning flags and, um, and, and all sorts of other um, harms. And then we also have urban districts that are historically and severely underfunded that are dealing with systematic racism in ways that um, you know, aren't impacting suburban or rural districts in the same way. So when, when we have to like, when I think of outside, it's hard to think what's outside of that because we have such a variety, but I think, um, we're constantly working on shifting to be able to communicate with different people and figuring out and weaving um, how to make sure that everyone sees themselves in the education justice world um, and community, even if you know it's the 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 white middle upper class mom from um, suburbia versus like the you know, other leaders and, you know, we have a wide diverse um, coalition of leaders in Detroit and Flint and um, Battle Creek and Benton Harbor. So I think, you know, it's a constant, uh, I feel like an art almost in terms of, you know, it's very relational based and there, there isn't a formula that we found, but it's, it's a constant like gut check of like, are we, weaving somebody out? Are we missing something that's really critically important? And especially like when we have policy work at the same time, like how do we make sure that we're not letting something fall through the cracks, especially, um, you know, our partners that are more like vulnerable, making sure they're really like, you know, at the center and 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 lifted up as leaders in, um, in those things. So that's, I don't, in, in communicating with it, it's, it's really like more of an art than a science for us. Um, in that sense, because um, it can be a challenge, but. Can I ask a question? Um, yeah. <laughs> I just want to know, because Monica, you named that you've um, made edits to your language to, to say, kind of fit into different rooms, but there's boundaries you won't cross. How do you think of your North Star? How do you decide? I mean, obviously it's, in, it's a case by case, but is there some big thing that you're like, oh, nope, or is it a no when you see it? That is such a good question. Um, 
I think for now it's a no when I see it. Um, and it, it, it also varies um, space to space. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how to, like, there's not a real formula. Um, sometimes you also have to operate on vibes, <laughs> which is very Gen Z of me, but sometimes you have to be um, really honest with yourself on, like, what kind of spaces are you able to be completely honest and transparent um, in um, that will sometimes remain confidential and what spaces you kind of have to tread a little bit more lightly um, and um, not necessarily be more neutral. Um, or strategic, but um, just uh, be really cautious um, because at the end of the day, um, sometimes the conversations that you have affect way more than just you. Um, it affects the rape crisis centers that are funded through your program. Uh, it affects um, the young people that are reached by your programming. So um, it, it, you kind of have to do like a risk assessment. At least that's how I go into these meetings. Um, and um, just operate on vibes and see if if it's a safe space to be completely honest, or um, if I kind of have to start uh, reframing these concepts. Um, so like with public health concepts, something I was going to talk about is um, if you if you use them as a framework and kind of as a starting point, that's great. Um, but you need to be able to like dissect those concepts and be able to explain what the actual essence of the concept is, especially when they're uh, under such scrutiny. So like, for example, um, health equity is something that um, in certain spaces here in Florida, you can't really talk about or name as health equity. Um, so you need to be able to really uh, be able to verbalize what health equity is without calling it health equity, because most people can agree on, um, yeah, we want everyone to leave, uh, to lead healthy, and happy lives and be able to reach their full health potential. Uh, but once you attach the world health equity, they kind of shut down the conversation. So um, just being able to like really dissect these concepts and, um, and not necessarily attach the names uh, that are sometimes even like inaccessible to communities. Um, because I think something that uh, we talked about earlier the panel is a lot of these public health initiatives have been used to leverage harm against communities too so there's um very valid uh skepticism when it comes to these uh concepts so uh just being able to break those issues down uh and i guess operate off of vibes i need to come up with a better uh formula for how i navigate those conversations but i think that's just me being honest and transparent for now <laughs> I also think it's good. You can't always put like a number or a definition of something. I saw some people in the chat really agreeing with the vibes. I also agree with the vibes. And sometimes you trust your gut. Sarah, I saw that you unmuted. Yeah, I I wanted to also affirm the vibe check because I think a vibe check is a great place to start. And while holding on to the understanding that we all come into spaces with bias and assumptions. And so like, how do we, as people who are holding power in these spaces, oftentimes also assess those, those biases and assumptions um, when we're coming into the space. And I think one of the things that, um, so for folks who don't know, Monica and I worked together um, collaboratively last year and kind of continue to do so um, because we were really seeing critical race theory in Florida and Ohio coming to a fever pitch um, and, and hearing about critical race theory getting conflated with social emotional learning and just recognizing that yes these frameworks are critical for us to understand like the work we do but how not only do we link those and connect those for messaging, education, and storytelling, but also how do we break down that into plain language? How do we make those links while bringing people in? And so some of the things I think about beyond the vibe checks is also like, is preparing organizationally, knowing that our, you know, like facilitators, folks who are on the ground doing the frontline work are going to get most impacted and oftentimes are coming into this work because they've in some form been impacted by sexual violence. And so there's a story there, right? There's, there's a story to why all of us get into this work. And it's not always about survivorship, but it oftentimes is based on the data that is told 
through the, you know, these stories of, of our passion. Why do we come into this field? And so some of the things that I think about beyond that is like organizationally, how are we preparing? How are we, you know, thinking about the ways that we safety plan? If we're safety planning with clients and externally, and we use these frameworks, how can we turn them internally and start to really safety plan and make sure that the person who is kind of doing the most vulnerable work in our communities isn't constantly also then impacted um, by the pushback and by the stories that can bump up against values and boundaries. Um, and to that point also is also reckoning with the professionalization of our field. So again, to harken back to what Monica was saying is also like our public health strategies are a great foundation. They're a great start for us, not only in these conversations, but also in the conversations externally while making that relatable, but also understanding that like to name, I mean, professionalized public health has harmed people. There is the supported eugenics movement. There's the AIDS crisis where CDC wouldn't name AIDS as an official virus or the outcome of the HIV virus for almost 20 years. And we have stories from people who survived that crisis today who lost everyone around them. We have, you know, people being hesitant about the vaccine for COVID, the yes, the forced sterilization of Black, Latina, and people with disabilities. We also see that with Indigenous communities. We see that there were genocidal tactics that were used and they were justified under public health frameworks. And so it's also holding not only those stories, those are experiences, that is education, that is informing how we move through the world. So it's also like us holding um, kind of that accountability um, that we would hope, right? That we are teaching. We're teaching these frameworks, but we also have to live those frameworks. So I think it's about not only being able to adjust our language, but also sit in the fact that like not everyone is going to trust what's coming out of our mouths. And so like, what does it also look like to relinquish some of that um, centering our voices and rather like finding community partners who are trusted in the community um, and finding those different unique ways to bring people into, um, into the work. I love that. And so speaking of bringing people into the work and speaking of vibes, um, I will name that the vibes right now, as it comes to prevention, school-based prevention, LGBTQ inclusivity, racial justice, Vibes are weird right now. Preventionists are navigating some weird vibes and it's really hard, right? Like, I mean, I don't think we don't need to spend a lot of time talking about what's happening. I think that most people on this call know or can find the information, but it is incredibly hard for anyone to do any kind of comprehensive sexual health education, LGBTQ inclusivity, to do the things that we know are integral to this work. And it's because of what we talked about earlier, that there is a really strong message coming from adversaries that is resonating with people, that's capturing people. And so what I would love to hear is how do we start to have conversations with our allies? And when I say allies, I mean maybe the less conventional allies, maybe the people who aren't the first ones to jump in and be like, oh, I love sex ed. How do we have, how do we bring those people in while knowing that they're also getting messaging from the other side? Oh gosh. Um, I, does anybody here approach it with, I love sex ed? I think we should try it. I think the, uh, the idea of allies in this question is really important. We just spent like a year with the RWJF studying health equity narratives and how to get people to shift toward embracing a health equity narrative. And this is really unexpected. You can move every single audience in the United States toward that, everyone. They don't all respond to the same stories, but every audience can move. So what I would strongly recommend is thinking of the challenges retelling stories rather than fixing people. 
The problem isn't the audiences, it's the stories. And when we take that approach, we can start to see superheroes around every corner. The biggest way to think about the people with whom you will collaborate, who are going to be in really unexpected corners of the culture, is that each of them has a superpower and those superpowers are not gonna be yours. So when we tell stories, what we're doing is co-creating a future. We are not trying to shift an audience to share our values because it's not gonna happen. We can shift an audience to share a vision of the future and different audiences are bringing superpowers to the table that you might not share. There are audiences that are great at imagining that alternative future, audiences that are great at systems thinking, audiences that are allergic to systems thinking but love to take action and audiences that are great at care and really care about kids more than anything else. So uh, the, the approach we find most effective is to look at who you have before you and imagine how they can be your ally and what stories we need to retell to get there. That's really powerful. I love that. Rethink how they can be your ally and what stories we need to get there. And Marta, you know, I'm thinking about you. We all interface with the education system, but I don't think any of us quite like you. So would you like to jump in on this? Okay, so I will say this, that this has been a struggle for us and our organizers on the ground that are in these school board meetings where people are like, especially during the pandemic, you saw this flare up big time. Um, Nazi salutes in some of our school districts. We had um, just some really out there, attacks. One thing I want to point out about the attacks is that I think that it's not necessarily that it's resonating with people. I think it's just so prolific and catching so many headlines. It's so extreme. It's so covering so many things. They'll show up on CRT one day, SEL another day. Um, They'll show up on, you know, just reading, uh, you know, books uh, in the school board meeting. Um, you know, there, there are so many different things that it's just like an onslaught and all the time. And so one of the issues that we've been working with our organizers on is just focus is just so challenging when you're dealing with all of these different attacks um, and figuring out like, okay, well, how do we counter that? How do we like position ourselves? How do we reach the people that are being influenced by this? And I think really like instead of focusing on counter attacks and stuff, like really coming back to and pivoting to what is your central story? What are the central like positive vision that you're putting out there? What's the solution you're moving towards? What's the thing that people can buy into? It's like, yes, um, this is this is exactly what we need to be to be moving towards. Um, with some of our school districts, we've actually been focusing on different issues then. Like what is gonna bring people in that then we can build them up to be, you know, comfortable talking about, well, it's really great having evidence-based sex education, at least to competent kids and blah, blah, blah. You know, there are ways that you can do that. And sometimes, you know, starting with issues um, in an area where it's highly politicized, highly charged, you know, a really well-funded and prolific opposition, that's, that can be like focusing on school funding or focusing on transparency and some things that can start to, to bring more folks in, gets people um, comfortable. And then you can build up towards rapid response while you're focusing on your main thing that you're building into um, uh, build, building people towards. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, it really does. And it kind of leads us into the next question. You know, we're talking a lot about what, where it's challenging, what's happening. What have you all seen working well to counter some of those toxic narratives and bring people in? Um, we've just been doing some of this around education as well as around health equity. Um, and this is not all me. Um, one of the orgs that I love more than anything else in the world is Galvanize. They've done a bunch of this work around this particular issue and they're finding that naming respect is a really important part of helping to peel off the audiences that aren't really attracted to the core power conversation that's underneath all of those different issues that Marta is naming. That's about power. That's about power and accumulation, but other audiences are being brought on by sub stories about safety, right? So you wanna peel those folks off and naming for them safety for kids and mutual respect is really important. And for other audiences, the stuff that really works um, is less about the care, compassion, and equity that tends to really move, like is the bulk of what we talk about already. So it's just, uh, there's lots. Choice can be really important. Just naming for people choice and liberty. 
and control, I realize that's weaponized. That word is weaponized, but control over your, your um, body is really important for some audiences and responsibility are some of the ways that you can lift up and bridge audiences with a vision for a positive future. All of those are things we're popping and testing. I love that. And I mean, you, that's the whole thing. We have to test. There is no, there's not a formula for this. It's about being willing to try something. Sarah and Megna, I know that you both also had something to add to this. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Um, thank you, Janae. Yeah, I feel uh, when you're thinking of community buy-in, and it's something that I've observed, not just at Gulabi Stories, but also in my consultancy work, is uh, when you think of community buy-in, right, like, or wondering, at the end of the day, no matter how much, how intentional we were, sometimes a program or a community dialogue ends up perpetuating oppression or toxicity, right? And it's not, like, intended towards that, but it happens. And then I think sometimes as a movement, um, we forget the historical and cultural context of some of the communities like first generation immigrants. So as a South Asian immigrant who is, holds a lot of privileges as an upper caste, um, educated, documented immigrant, um, you know, for me, it, it's also like keeping that in mind that I, you know, I end up forgetting about casteism, for example, right? So just keeping those things in mind, like when I come to these spaces, just like kind of checking in with my privileges, but also, as I said, like, you know, the social cultural context of many communities, and I just want to give an example, like first generation immigrants, right, who are still hesitant to talk about sex, sex ed or body autonomy or reproductive health. And I wish I wish I had that information, um, you know, as a younger maintenance, right, uh, because it's empowerment. Um, so I think I think I'm also being aware as, as someone who is completed, you know, a come from a very different academic discipline of criminology and gender studies. I'm so aware of not using language that's elitist academic, right? Or even using language that we use in our moment because that may not be relatable to our community members, right? Uh, so just keeping, I mean, I know we have talked about language and I, I just, but I also wanted to like, you know, kind of highlight that. Um, another example, I've been told that sometimes like men and, you know, again, this is not just an immigrant communities. We know that it happens everywhere. But for example, uh, you know, based on my experience, men and immigrant communities are interested in donating, but they don't want to participate or attend a community event because it talks about a social issue that they feel uncomfortable with, right? So like, how do we address that? And do I have all the answers? I have to be honest, no. But I think it's a conversation that we need to keep evolving with the change of, you know, times, right? Like with the time change and community needs change. Um, so I think how do we create that baby steps or building blocks towards creating that trust and connection with these communities that are hard to reach? We talk about consent, but then we also, there's, there's a possibility that we end up stereotyping like third world countries, oh, it's the problem is there, you know, we need to save them, you know, kind of thing. So, and when I say we means, I, I feel like as a moment, as, you know, as a collective group. Um, so I think we have to be like more aware of not to go there, you know, not to create this culture of, trauma Olympics or oppression Olympics um, as uh, the well-known uh, restorative justice practitioner Sujata Baliga has shared about storytelling. So I think just embracing those nuances, I, you know, again, it's an evolving process and it's okay to be messy. It's okay to be complex in this process of buy-in, what works, what doesn't work, and to kind of take a step back and then, you know, kind of problem solve, keeping the cultural context in mind and um, other struggles that specific communities may have compared to the general, you know, American population, if I may say. Thank you. And I think, you know, we have about 10, less than 10 minutes left. So, you know, I think I'd like to close us out with this final question. How would you like the story of prevention to be told? What stories need to make it out of our work of these spaces and into communities? And Sarah, I'd love to start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when I think about prevention, I think about the word already being steeped in stigma. Um, 
I think about the ways that prevention, just the word itself is working against something um, just in like how people interpret the word prevention, right? Um, when we're talking about the fact that like what works really well, how do we change our language? How do we connect with folks? How do we connect it to social justice? When we talk about prevention, there's an automatic kind of um, correlation to we're working against something, right? And so something that I think is so special about us all in the space is that we all come to this work from very different perspectives, lived experiences, um, different skill sets. And so one of the things that I've talked about in various spaces before, and I feel so um, influenced by is um, an organizer who's no longer with us, Tony K. Bambara, talking about um, being a culture worker rather than, um, say, an organizer. And so this idea that instead of us being preventionists, we're actually shaping culture, not only the culture that currently exists, but the culture we want. And so how do we shift our stories about prevention? How do we make um, how do we how do we take it out of our own field and into our communities? I think it really is also about not rebranding, but really thinking about the fact that we are part of a quilt already. Um, that there are people out there, organizers out there, who are already working um, towards something. Right? We're working toward a world that is. A, a safe, joyful, pleasurable place for us to exist. We know that for many that doesn't exist currently, but how do we stop getting stuck in a loop of patching holes and calling it systemic change because we're using anti-oppressive language? What does it look like for us to approach this work from a pleasure-centered space? Um, one of the things I think about, back to Megna's point about consent is like, we can take these lessons and make them so pleasurable. We don't have to talk about them from a deficit model in the sense that, so thinking about embodied consent, we can tell the story of how we consensually exist with the earth. We can, um, we can learn and, and not co-opt indigenous stories about living consensually with the earth. That can be taught in a classroom where you ask the students to go pick something outside and decide whether or not they're gonna take a picture of it or they're going to take it back into the classroom. And then you ask, okay, what were the decisions? Why did you decide that it was okay to pick that versus take a picture of it, right? These are ways that we can start to embody this across all different types of work. Um, so I just think that we can also stop talking about prevention from preventing the inevitable, but actually leaning into the human experience that we all have and will cause harm. So instead of trying to avoid that, what does repair look like? What's the story of repair? What is the education around repair? What is the messaging around repair? And how does that move beyond the punitive systems that continue to harm and just create cycles of violence? Because we know that sending a person into prison is another site of sexual violence very often. And so we're just creating these cyclical things and saying that that's justice. So what does it look like to provide survivor-centered options and survivor-centered stories? Survivors tell us, right, that there's such a limited option for justice and oftentimes it doesn't work for them. And so part of that prevention is that as well. So those are some of the thoughts that I have on how do we tell a different story? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And Monica, I'd love to, I'd love to close it out with your thoughts. Yeah, um, first, let me fangirl. Aren't the other panelists so great? I could literally listen to you all day. You're amazing. Um, I, agree with everything Sarah has said, um, like to the thousandth percent. Um, and then I think from my perspective, something else that I would like to see our movement embrace more that we've kind of been moving towards that direction, um, but we haven't fully embraced is really uplifting young people um, and like um, valuing them as the experts of their lived experience. Um, a lot of the prevention outreach, I mean, I don't know about y'all, but at least in Florida, is really focused on young people, uh, whether it's in schools or um, in other places that they are hanging out in the community. 
Um, but it's really adults dictating what that prevention outreach and education looks like. Um, there's never any young people involved in um, like the creation or the development or the delivery of all of this. Um, it's really just adults deciding what young people should um, be exposed to, what experiences they should have an opportunity to be a part of. Um, and then the young people have to go along with it. So I would love to see um, the movement embrace young people more um, and move toward a like youth-centered, youth-directed, youth-led uh, movement, at least uh, the parts that truly affect the young people. Um, I, I work a lot in the youth homelessness space as well. And that's something that some organizations have been doing really, um, really cool work. Uh, Point Source Youth um, is a really good example of or an organization that compensates the youth. Uh, so not just um, like including youth uh, and like the development of materials and then being like, okay, this is like internship or volunteer experience and you can add it to your resume, but like actually paying them a consultancy fee um, and like a competitive fee as well, like $115 an hour for all the work that you do. Um, and this is stuff that uh, the young people can use in their like professional development, um, being able to expand their uh, professional networks, but also uh, being able to connect with other young people and other youth consultants. So I think that's something that we could definitely include into our movement and um, really just value youth and young people more. Um, I don't think we give them enough credit. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I would like to see. Janae, you are muted. Our, my male, a male person is about to come up and my dog is going to bark. So I do apologize. Um, but thank you so much, Monica, for closing us out there. And to all of our panelists, you know, I, we could continue to have this conversation. I think for like two more hours, I cut out a lot of questions. Um, but since we're coming up on time, I just want to thank everyone so much for being here. And, and again, a huge round of Zoom applause for our panelists, for Ricky, Sarah, Monica, Magna, and Marta. Thank you so much for your expertise, all of you. And for everyone who is interested, one week from today, we are having the fifth and final session of our Health Equity in Practice series, How to Build Cross-Movement Partnerships to Advance Health Equity. So thank you all again so much. We'll be sending out an evaluation right after this, as well as a recording and resources, everything that Ashley was putting in the chat and where you can get more information on our panelists. So thank you all so much for being here. And I'm going to open the waiting room again. So for our panelists, we want to hang for a minute. And if you get put into our waiting room, um, that's just us ending the web conference. But we thank you so much for being here.